There's gonna be a lot of allegedly's and supposedly's in this video. Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. This is part two of the tragic life and death of Natalie Wood. Before we get started, I wanna give a birthday shout out to a couple of my patrons who are celebrating their birthday this week. Happy birthday, Laura, who celebrates her birthday on June 2nd, and happy birthday to Emma Boyce, who celebrates her birthday on June 7th. Thank you so much to my patrons. I love you guys, you support me, you're everything. So let's move right on to the video. There's gonna be a lot of allegedly's and supposedly's in this part, just because obviously I have to protect myself legally. Some of these people that we're talking about are still alive and deny these claims and allegations that we're gonna be talking about further. So if you hear those words, just know it's because I don't have any proof, but that's what is said, that's what is felt. But let's just do it, let's move right on into part two of the tragic life and death of Natalie Wood. Now tomorrow I leave for Crime Con, tomorrow will be Thursday and hopefully I'll have this video posted by then, but Thursday morning I do leave for Crime Con and I will not be back until Monday afternoon. And at that point, I will obviously resume filming part three of this and have that posted for you midweek, but it is going to kind of put a gap in the videos, in any videos. I won't be able to put anything out while I'm gone, but I will have lots of cool stuff to talk with you about when I get back. There's gonna be a little hiatus though, so I will miss you guys and I hope you miss me too. On Natalie's 16th birthday, her parents gifted her a pink Thunderbird convertible, which was paid for with her money, of course. And the Gurdons moved again, this time to Sherman Oaks in Ventura, California. Natalie seemed to be finally fully embracing the glamorous movie star lifestyle that her mother had always wanted her to be a part of. By the time she turned 16, any remnant of her childhood was gone. She told people she was 18. She spent her days and nights after school dropping hundreds of dollars on shopping sprees, being seen at all the latest and most hip restaurants, going out to nightclubs. She started to date a lot of men, civilian and actor alike. Out from under her mother's thumb, she went a little wild. But even though technically she was her own person now, she could make her own decisions, she'd made a deal with her mother that she could do whatever she wanted, Maria had ingrained herself and woven herself so deeply into the thread of Natalie's life that Natalie still didn't feel quite right when Maria wasn't trying to come in and control things. At the same time that she wanted to break away, she didn't feel complete unless her mother was very heavily involved in her everyday life. And if she was gone out of the house all day, she would call several times to check in with Maria. Around this time, Natalie's friends remember her being persistently cheerful, never bothered or upset by anything. But those closest to her knew this was a performance. She was always on, always acting, as she had done since before she could remember. Life was a stage and they were all actors. But behind the scenes, she was on a path of disaster. She was only 95 pounds and she drank heavily whenever she went out to the point where she would often pass out. She hated being alone, something she had held onto from her childhood. And even though she acted as if she was a grown woman, she could at any moment turn into a moody teenager. The need to be constantly doing something or with someone was a temporary escape from the constant fear and anxiety that was always crushing down on her. As soon as she got home at night and the parties and the people were a distant memory, her panic and restlessness began to set in. She started taking sleeping pills, unable to fall asleep on her own while her mind was racing. And through all this, through dating boy after boy, one man still remained in her head, Robert Wagner. She had never lost her childhood crush on him. She still made sure to see every movie that he was in in the theaters. She began planning on how she could arrange a meeting with him and win his heart the way that he'd won hers. She made a plan to be signed by the same agent, Henry Wilson, who represented big names at the time like Tab Hunter and Rock Hudson. Mainly, he was known for being the agent to closeted gay men. It would be discovered many years later that both Tab Hunter and Rock Hudson were closeted gay actors. At that time, it wasn't as accepted as it is today. It wasn't as supported as it is today. You had to be that heartthrob, that uh, romantic ideal for every woman, a man that every single girl would look at and wanna be with and bring home to mom and dad. She got her wish and in November of 1954, Henry Wilson became her agent. 
Wilson was also gay, and in those days, it was not something that a lot of people were comfortable with, which is why many of his clients hid their sexuality and dated and married women in order to build their stud persona. Now, Maria had been against the idea of Natalie hiring Wilson, knowing that it was her goal to meet and marry Robert Wagner. Bobby Hyatt claimed that at one point, Maria confided in him that the whole plan made her nervous. She told Bobby, I don't want Natalie to meet this Robert Wagner. He's with Henry Wilson, and you know what that means. Although Maria may not have been a fan of Henry Wilson or Robert Wagner, Wilson had the presence of mind to tell Natalie that he would arrange a date between her and RJ, but not until she was 18. Robert Wagner was older than her, so he wanted to make sure she was an adult before he set her up on a date with an adult man. Thank God somebody at that time had some kind of moral high ground in Hollywood. I mean, at that time, Robert Wagner was 24 when Natalie was 16, and Robert Wagner was dating Barbara Stanwyck secretly, and she was like 22 years older than him, so it just wasn't the right time for them, to say the least. Wilson got her a part in a CBS drama called I Am a Fool, starring across from the new kid on the block at that time, James Dean. It was her first love scene, and she was nervous when she showed up on set to meet the young man that Hollywood was all abuzz about. He showed up late on his motorcycle wearing his leather jacket, and Natalie claimed she found him very exotic and attractive. At first, James Dean hadn't made up his mind about the 16-year-old who was making eyes at him. He told her, you're just a child actor, and she responded, it's better than acting like a child, to which he laughed about, thought that was funny, and from then on, they were very close friends. Her interaction with the intense and tortured James Dean inspired her to become a serious actress. To take on projects that allowed her to break free from the wholesome and girlish roles she'd played before. So when her old co-star, Bobby Hyatt, from Miracle on 34th Street, called her up and told her that there was this project that he thought she should read the script for, called Rebel Without a Cause, she did read the script, and she immediately fell in love with. And it didn't hurt that her new buddy, her friend James Dean, who she had incredible electric chemistry on screen with, and who was the reason she was even looking to do more serious roles. He was slated to play the lead. Maria didn't want her daughter to have anything to do with this movie. She considered it too dark and gritty for Natalie. Everyone was telling her not to take it. It was a controversial concept. It would be a real risk for Natalie, who was seen as a certain type and a certain way in Hollywood. But Natalie stuck to her guns and she threatened to run away and become an actual juvenile delinquent if she wasn't allowed to read for the part. Maria had to comfort herself with the fact that at least Natalie was getting back into movies and that would mean more money for her. I think a lot of people thought that Natalie and James Dean would hook up, but it wasn't her young co-star that she became enamored with and intimate with during Rebel Without a Cause. She interviewed with the director of the movie, 44-year-old Nicholas Ray, and by the time she had her first screen test, 10 days later, the two had already begun sleeping together. According to a friend of Natalie's at the time, Ray brought her to a fancy restaurant with pink tablecloths. Pink was her favorite color, after all. He poured her champagne and gave her a key to his bungalow at the Chateau Marmont. It was after he had slept with her that he was like, yeah, you should read for the part of Judy in Rebel, which I'm sure surprised Natalie because she was 16 at this time, he was 44. And she probably thought, you know, that the part was pretty much hers, that she'd cinched it and locked it up. But no, Nicholas Ray, the 44-year-old man who was sleeping with the 16-year-old girl who was going to be an actress in the film that he was directing, he was too much of a professional to just give her the part after that. And although Nicholas Ray had an obvious interest in keeping his relationship with Natalie under wraps in private, she told her friends, who were all insanely jealous with how romantic Natalie made it sound. Maria also pretty much figured it out because she was having Natalie followed. She had her followed to Nicholas Ray's bungalow at the Chateau Marmont. Natalie went in didn't come back out all night. Maria pretty much figured it out. Any other mother would have walked right up to that bungalow door, knocked on the door, knocked him out, and taken their kid home, but not Maria. She allowed it to go on. The show must go on, and if this helped Natalie's career, then the sacrifice was worth it. Often, when I read about this relationship between Nicholas Ray and Natalie Wood, it's painted in such a rosy picture, which drives me crazy, as if it was a love story, as if the two of them were in love. 
as if there's no unequal power dynamics. A huge age gap, older man, younger girl. Older director who has the power to give the actress the role that she wants, that she needs to see herself as a more serious actress. Younger girl who wants this part so bad, she might do anything to get it. This was not love. They were not on equal playing fields. This was not love, this was abuse. As far as I'm concerned, allegedly, he was a predator. Just my opinion, allegedly, supposedly, whatever. I mean, guys, come on, he was a predator. He was a predator. At the same time as she was secretly seeing Nicholas Ray, Natalie was also having a relationship with Dennis Hopper. According to Hopper, Natalie hit on him the moment they met, saying he was good looking and she wanted to sleep with him. And it was at this time as well, at 16, that Natalie found out how ruthless, dirty, and dark Hollywood and the movie industry could be. She went to the hotel room of an older, well-known actor slash producer who told her that he wanted her to read for him from a script that he was working on. That evening, this man, after telling her that he always wanted to be with a teenaged girl, raped her. It is rumored that this attack on Natalie Wood was very violent and vicious and went on for hours. And before she left, he told her, if you ever tell anyone, it'll be the last thing that you do. This account is supported by many people that Natalie knew at the time and would know and tell later. Scott Marlowe, a man she would date in 1956, Marianne, her closest friend at the time, and Faye Newell, her closest friend on the set of Rebel, they all say similar things. They all recount similar stories. And Lana, Natalie's younger sister, remembers sitting in the car with Maria Gurdon outside the Chateau Marmont while they waited for Natalie for hours. Then Natalie was in there with this actor slash producer for so long that Lana eventually fell asleep in the back seat. And when Natalie got in the car, she was very upset. And on the way home, although she doesn't remember exactly what her mother and sister were talking about, she remembers them talking in very heated and upset undertones. According to Lana, Natalie, in a way, blamed Maria for being too eager for Natalie to get roles, that she would put her in such a vulnerable position. The man who did it was never held accountable. Maria didn't want to cause drama or make a high-powered enemy. Nothing ever happened. Now, Natalie never publicly named her rapist. However, rumors and accusations and speculations have flown around in recent years. On a blog called Crazy Days, an anonymous longtime commenter with the username him accused Kirk Douglas of being Natalie's attacker. Here is the post. This story concerns one of the biggest male stars ever and one of the most beloved female stars to ever live. One day she was invited to meet with this movie star about an upcoming major role. This man was a legend already and was very powerful. Thinking she herself was powerful and savvy, she accepted the invite in his hotel room. She never saw it coming. Without even discussing the film, this actor, drunk already, began making a pass at her. She politely declined and excused herself. He wouldn't have it. He literally threw her down, slapped the hell out of her, and ripped her clothes off. He shouted obscenities at her, continually punched, and held her arms so tight he left scars and bruises. When she came to, the actor was still in the room gloating and told her to come see him tomorrow night and he might give her the role. He laughed at her as she fell down, her legs so wobbly and weak. She gathered her torn clothes and tried to walk out of the hotel into her car. Her mom said she must have made the actor mad and offended him. They called a doctor who took her to the hospital secretly to have her treated. The studio knew and did nothing. After all, the star actor was a money machine. She grew into an amazing woman with a legendary career, but she never forgot or forgave and never got over what happened. She never named the star actor publicly, but her friends and family knew the truth. Even after marriage and kids, if she saw this actor anywhere, she would almost convulse and cry. And worst of all, Hollywood and the world continue to honor him, pay him, and treat him like a king. Today, he's still alive and barely holding on, but those who know the truth are still hoping and praying he will rot in hell for eternity, that all his good deeds and donations will never mask the truth. So when the time comes, and the now 95-year-old Kirk Douglas, the superstar actor, finally dies, there will be tributes and honors about him. Just remember that he is a monster who never repented, apologized, nor showed any sorrow for destroying the lives of others, especially the life of the young, beloved actress named Natalie Wood. It's generally accepted or believed that 
the poster, him, is Robert Downey Jr., even though his spokesperson denies it. It had something to do with the poster saying he worked on a movie with Natasha, who was Natalie's daughter, that she would later have in the late 90s, and everybody kind of did their investigation online and found out that the only movie that Natasha was in in the late 90s was in a movie with Robert Downey Jr. And Robert Downey Jr. just kind of has that personality where you feel like he would just call someone out and he wouldn't be afraid of what would happen or worry about what people thought about him. And if it is him or if it is somebody on the inside, they would know, they would have access to that. And people tend to believe this. It's pretty much understood that everybody who knows what happened to Natalie thinks it was Kirk Douglas who did it to her. Allegedly, supposedly, don't come for me, Kirk Douglas, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Michael Douglas, none of y'all, because you know, Kirk Douglas is still holding on, man. He's still holding on. He's like 500 years old. Nothing ever happened to Kirk Douglas. In fact, at the 2018 Golden Globes, a 101-year-old Kirk Douglas was presented an award for best screenplay at an event where almost everyone dressed in black in a move of solidarity for the Time's Up movement. Twitter blew up with protests about what a farce the whole thing was, how it was an insult to every woman who had ever been sexually abused by a powerful man only to have it swept under the rug. I mean, obviously, like I said, this is all speculation. I have no proof that Kirk Douglas was involved in Natalie Wood's rape. I have no proof that Natalie Wood was even raped. However, so many people that she talked to at that time come back with the same story, including her sister, including her closest friends at the time, including her boyfriend that she would date years later and tell him what happened to her at this time. So it clearly was impactful. It clearly stayed with her. I do believe something happened to her. And with the time that she was becoming famous in, the casting couch, the horrible, dirty things that go on in Hollywood, this stuff does happen today. This stuff happened then. It may not be the side of Hollywood, that we wanna think about when we go and sit down and watch a movie, but it's happening behind the scenes. According to Scott Marlowe, when Natalie confided in him about what had happened later, Maria Gurdon thought that, you know, it was great. It was great that Natalie had spent a night with Mr. Showbiz, that it would improve her career. And Natalie never reported it because she thought it would ruin her career. Dennis Hopper claims it would have ruined her career. At that time, the studio system was controlling them completely. But Maria also took the opportunity to kind of shove an I told you so in her daughter's face. See, sex was something you should be afraid of. I believe that this attack, as well as her mother's reaction to it or non-reaction to it, it changed Natalie and it would forever affect the way she handled relationships from that point on. Natalie was embroiled in this reckless and thrill-seeking life of Hollywood at this time. She was functioning on what felt good instead of what was smart. They all were. While Natalie was waiting to hear if she'd gotten the part of Judy, and Nicholas Ray was both sleeping with her and not casting her at the same time, she was a raw and exposed nerve, living in a state of the unknown. Dennis and Natalie, along with one of Natalie's friends, went to lunch and then for drinks to try and calm her, and they all imbibed far too much. Not to mention, none of them were of legal drinking age. They were all teenagers at this time. When they finally got in the car to go home shortly after midnight, Natalie was a mess because she hadn't heard from Ray about the part yet, and the alcohol only expanded and dramatized her emotions. They drove up the winding and twisting terrain of Laurel Canyon, and Hopper pulled off to park on Mulholland Drive so they could look up at the stars and sip from a bottle of whiskey he'd purchased. Dennis fell asleep and Natalie began to throw up. When he heard her getting sick, he woke up and even though he was much too drunk to drive, he decided it was time to get her home. It had begun to rain as they crept back down Laurel Canyon and their car ran headlong into another. Natalie was thrown from the car, knocked unconscious and had to be brought to the emergency room. The three teenagers were so scared, they called Nicholas Ray because he was older, and he would know what to do and he probably had some sort of interest in keeping this story under wraps. When he arrived at the hospital, Natalie, who was awake, allegedly said, Nick, they called me a goddamn juvenile delinquent. Do I get the part now? She got the part, but from that point on, she was much more afraid of driving in cars and she was always especially terrified of Laurel Canyon. She was also terrified of the new role she had just acquired. She was insecure of her ability to actually be the serious actress that she wanted everyone to see her as. She knew she would get up there next to James Dean with his natural intensity and he would act circles around her. 
Natalie represented the golden age of Hollywood, but James Dean was an indie actor, a method actor. For him, it wasn't just about memorizing the lines, it was about living them. While she was carrying on an affair with a much older man and drinking and smoking way too much with Hopper and his crew, her studio was setting her up on constant dates or photo ops with other young men from the studio. These dates were basically for publicity, like I said before, but also now to cover up what she was kind of doing in her personal life. They wanted her to be seen more as an adult so she could get parts, but they didn't want her to be seen as a reckless and crazy teenager like she was actually being. So they'd set her up with the tab hunters of the world, the clean cut, yes ma'am, no man, good manners, nice kind of wholesome all-American boy type. And Natalie had no interest in the guys that her mother and the studio were cohorting together to set her up with. She said they were too basic, too conservative, just boring. She didn't like that. Right now, she was in the part of her life where she really wanted to feel something. She liked being a thrill seeker. She liked being with a guy that got her blood heated, that made her feel like she was living on the edge or she was doing something kind of wrong. She liked that bad boy, like James Dean. Even in Nicholas Ray, it was an illicit relationship. It was something that was out of the ordinary. It was something that if people knew about it, they would be shocked. And that's what she was into at that time, thinking outside of the box when it came to dating and relationships. Since Natalie had grown up, I guess if you can consider a 16 year old grown up, Maria didn't have her little doll to dress up and parade around anymore, so she turned her sights on Lana. She wanted Lana to get into acting, and little Lana wanted nothing to do with that. Both Maria and Lana followed Natalie to Utah where she was filming The Searchers with John Wayne on a Navajo reservation. She turned 17 on the set spent her time flirting with John Wayne's son, Pat, the only other teenager at the remote location. The dolls in her room had been replaced with a zoo of stuffed tigers. She had taken to collecting tiger stuffed animals after Nicholas Ray had given her one upon the completion of Rebel Without a Cause. She said in one interview that she kept the tigers around to keep her from getting lonely or depressed. She bit the bullet and pushed her fear of flying aside when she flew to New York City to promote Rebel when she was 17. She brought along her stuffed tigers to keep her feeling safe and secure. At 17, she had the insecurities of a girl who was much younger than she was. It's just another sign that she acted like a grown woman on the outside, but inside, she was still a scared little girl who felt like she had to bring stuffed tigers with her when she went on a plane so she wouldn't be alone or scared. While there, she saw her first Broadway play, Anastasia, and she found herself in tears. And as somebody who has seen Anastasia on Broadway, it is a very emotional, beautiful show. I highly recommend it. But for Natalie, obviously, it had a bigger meaning to her. It reminded her of her childhood. She was raised by a mother who claimed she was related to the Romanovs. She was raised by a father who looked up to the Romanov family. In fact, there was a mural painted on the wall that she could see from her crib of the entire Romanov family. This musical to her obviously represented a lost childhood. That's what she felt that she had experienced and that's what she saw that Anastasia had experienced, losing her childhood, losing her memory. The parallels between the two stories, what she was experiencing in real life, what she had experienced, and what she was seeing on that stage were too close to home for her and they made her very emotional. While she was in Manhattan, she got the horrible news. Her close friend, mentor, and inspiration James Dean had been killed in a car crash. A brilliant career and life cut short. Rebel Without a Cause would come out right around the time of his funeral. And I have to think that his tragic premature death had something to do with how popular the movie ended up being. And as a result, how popular Natalie herself became after its premiere. One car accident had helped Natalie get the role in the movie, and another had made it a classic. Warner Brothers assigned Natalie to a seven-year contract, and her mother allowed her to open a checking account in her own name, where she could deposit a portion of her earnings, a small portion of her earnings. The rest kept going into Maria Gurdon's greedy hands. She began a film called A Cry in the Night, co-starring across from Raymond Burr. The movie was about a young woman who is kidnapped by a man who intends to rape and possibly kill her. 
Natalie began a relationship with yet another older man, Raymond Burr himself, which considering her past with sexual assault speaks volumes about the mental state she was constantly in. He played her aggressor, her captor, her abuser. Natalie ended up becoming very infatuated with him. They would spend a lot of time together. He was a lover of food and introduced her to delicacies she had never tried before, like escargot. But no matter how much she tried to bring their chaste relationship to the next level, he never took the bait, which she took personally. Eventually, she found out he was gay and was crushed when she realized she would never be able to be with him the way she wanted. But he was good for her in a way that no one had been before. He enjoyed being with her because of who she was, not because what he could get from her. He was a sensitive, gentle, smart, and kind man, and he protected her and treated her with respect and civility. It was speculated that Raymond Burr, who was in the closet at that time, like every other gay man in Hollywood, did use her in a way as a beard, but a longtime companion of Burr's would later reveal that Raymond was in love with Natalie and cared for her. Eventually, the studio got wind of their relationship and threatened her to end it, trying to take away the one relationship in her life that would have done her more good than bad. In the end, Crying the Night was met with poor reviews, being called a tasteless and makeshift melodrama. To me, the title of the movie has a strong and scary sense of foreshadowing, considering what eyewitnesses would say many years later about the night that Natalie Wood went into the water and drowned. Even though her studio had threatened her to drop Burr, Natalie was infatuated with him, and she continued to see him. She tried to keep it secret. She was so enthralled with Raymond Burr at this time that when she finally did run in to RJ, or Robert Wagner, at a party, she didn't even notice him, really. He was there. She'd been obsessed with him for years. She'd even hired an agent specifically so she could meet him. And now he was right in front of her and she wasn't interested because her heart and her mind were elsewhere. RJ and Natalie danced together for the cameras and the gossip columns, but the studio had also been pushing on her another closeted gay actor named Tab Hunter. The two were starring in a romantic movie together and the studio thought it would be good for them to be seen out and about and kind of start the rumors as to whether they might be seeing each other outside of the movie because that would bring more publicity and more people filling the seats of the movie theater if the actor and actress that were starring in the movie together were actually in a relationship. People love that stuff. The tabloids printed picture after picture of Natalie and Tab together doing wholesome things like visiting a candy store, speculating on their off-screen romance. But Natalie's ongoing relationship with Raymond Burr was ruining Warner Brothers' plans when she would also be seen and photographed with him doing more adult scandalous things like having drinks at Coconut Grove. The studio gave her the choice, enough with this relationship and no more going out and drinking. She was forbidden to be photographed with a drink in her hand or in the company of anyone Warner Brothers deemed unfit. A man from the studio began following her around at night and to events to make sure she complied with the rules. Just as she had pushed back against her mother's controlling ways, she rebelled against her studio's control over her personal life. For the time being, she was not concerned with being a problematic actress and no one wanted to work with. At 17, she had established herself in the realm of Hollywood and she had a contract. She began playing sick on set, a passive aggressive way to protest the studio's interference into her relationships. The movie that she was filming was called Burning Hills with Tab Hunter and she didn't take it seriously after Rebel Without a Cause, which was her, you know, her first foray into serious acting, Burning Hills to her was just a joke. It was some sort of a campy, romantic, western film, Tab Hunter as a cowboy, Natalie Wood as the Mexican girl who falls in love with him and cares for him, and she had to put on this black curly wig and put on this ridiculous, what she called a Carmen Miranda accent, and she just thought it was not to be taken seriously. She thought it was beneath her. And as if Burning Hills needed to hold any less appeal for Natalie, while she was filming the movie, she received her Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress in Rebel Without a Cause. And she continued to flaunt her relationship with Raymond Burr in the studio's face. She told a reporter that Raymond and she had an understanding for the future, which prompted the reporter to report that it looked like Natalie and Raymond might be talking about marriage. 
It was the last straw for Warner Brothers who planted a piece in Variety, the magazine, saying that it was Tab Hunter who would be accompanying Natalie Wood to the Academy Awards, trying to dispel any rumors that she and Raymond were engaged or were going to be married. They also forced Natalie to print a retraction of what she'd said previously, and she went with Tab Hunter to the Academy Awards, even though she wanted to be there with Raymond. She did offer one last stand though, because as she was getting ready to go to the Academy Awards, she told the girl who was doing her hair, chop it off. She showed up to the Academy Awards, flaunting her new modern and stylish pixie cut, and she sat next to Tab Hunter and bravely smiled as she lost the award to Joe Van Fleet. On July 20th, her 18th birthday, Natalie had her first real date with Robert Wagner. The promise that Henry Wilson had made her, that he would introduce them and set them up on a date when she turned 18 had been fulfilled. But at this time, Natalie's interests and tastes in men had changed since she was 11. She was more interested in that edgier, bad boy, serious actor, like New York City actors studio, Broadway, off-Broadway, just a more serious method actor like James Dean. RJ was your typical old Hollywood heartthrob. He modeled himself after the Cary Grants of the world, and she just wasn't actually into that at that time. She was actually engaged to Scott Marlowe now. Scott Marlowe had been a friend of James Dean's, and they were very similar in their personalities and their acting methods. You know, the whole hipster, I'm anti-establishment. I want to be a serious actor. I never get too excited about anything. That's the kind of guy she was into. RJ was not like that. RJ was, you know, I'm gonna wear a tux when I pick you up for a lunch date kind of thing. If we walk through 12 doors, I'm gonna hold every single one open for you and bow as you go through. RJ was the guy who would take off his coat and put it over a puddle like you see in the old cartoon so she could walk over it and not get her feet wet. She went on a date with RJ to the premiere of his movie, The Mountain, but she got ready for the date in Scott's room at the Chateau Marmont and came back to his room afterwards talking about how RJ was a sweet guy but so boring. The next morning, RJ sent her flowers. She thought that it was cute. She put them in water and then she went on planning her wedding to Scott Marlowe. Natalie then fired Henry Wilson, who she believed was not giving her career enough attention and he'd already fulfilled his promise for the whole RJ thing, so pretty much thank you next. And Maria and the studio were once again campaigning for her to end a relationship that they didn't think was good for her image. Scott Marlowe was actually very good for Natalie herself, personally. Like her high school boyfriend, Jimmy, he had helped her overcome some of her phobias for a time. And like her teenage crush, James Dean, he taught her that acting needed to come from a place of truth. Eventually, after being introduced to Elvis Presley through a friend that Natalie's mother had enlisted to come between her and Marlowe, and added pressure from Maria and the studio, the engagement ended and so did the relationship. Scott Marlowe was, like I said, that anti-establishment. He didn't really like what Hollywood represented. He didn't like the money and the glamour and the fakeness of everything. So he didn't want to go with her to these award shows. He didn't want to put on an act. Her studio really needed somebody like that for her. But Maria liked Elvis Presley. Even though he had that bad boy persona, he was Elvis and any affiliation with him would help Natalie, especially being seen with him and photographed with him. Natalie moved out of her parents' house at the age of 18 and began spending a lot of time with Elvis and his friends at the Beverly Wilshire where he lived. He invited her to fly with him to Graceland in Memphis, his hometown, and without telling her studio and flying under a secret name, she did. But Presley's bad boy persona was just that, a persona. He was deeply religious, he didn't curse, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, and at his heart, he was just a regular and good person, not the worldly, dark, and tumultuous personality that Natalie was drawn to. Five months after their first and only date, Robert Wagner and Natalie Wood bumped into each other again at an after party. Their first real date that wasn't set up by the studio was ironically on his sailboat called My Lady. An overstressed, overanxious Natalie found the evening on the water with RJ peaceful, an escape from the lights and action of the city, where she could float for hours and stare at the stars without a care in the world. Even though she was still terrified of water, it was a fear of going in the water, and she felt separated from that on a boat. 
Plus, RJ had a mellow and calming aura about him. He was laid back and relaxed. Robert Wagner claims at this point he fell head over heels for Natalie, but she hadn't gotten to that point yet. She was still keeping a never-ending cycle of admirers and boyfriends rotating through her life in the following months. She told a magazine reporter that she would often have three dates with three different men in one night. She was young and living it up, but she couldn't burn the candle at both ends for very much longer. Later, she would admit that she thinks she fell in love much too quickly with anybody, not just with RJ, not just with Elvis, not just with Nicholas Ray, anybody. She fell in love so quickly. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can admit that that's how we were too in our teenage years. Every new relationship felt so exciting. Every new person that we became involved with felt like it was the only person we would ever have feelings for again. That's how teenagers are, but she was doing all of this with a, an entire country, an entire world sometimes watching her. So she was under a lot of scrutiny and that had to have been difficult. People around her began to notice that she was on a bad path. With the level-headed influence of Scott Marlowe gone, her phobias returned full force. Friends would say that if she read a book where there was an illness talked about or somebody was talking about an illness, she would immediately once again think that she had that illness. That would last for a couple of days or a couple of weeks and then she would never talk about it again. People would see her at parties, drinking and smoking heavily, holding her cigarette with a shaking hand. She was losing weight at an accelerated rate, which she attributed to nerves. The magazines wrote that she had too many boyfriends. They criticized her for seeing Frank Sinatra, a man who was old enough to be her father. She gained a reputation for being boy crazy and an unstable personality. And RJ, who was shooting a movie in Japan, would call her often just to stay in her peripheral, to remind her that he was there because he really was infatuated with her. On her 19th birthday, a year after their first fake date, their first fake setup date, he brought her out on his sailboat and he gave her a mink stole. Natalie's studio was over the moon about her seeing RJ. This was exactly what she needed to rehabilitate her image, to pick a guy and settle down. And what better guy than man of the year, good-natured, smiling Robert Wagner. She was beaten down by her mother in her studio, bullying her every time she fell in love or went out in public with a man. She was tired of being made to feel like a disappointment. And at her core, she was still that little girl who was compelled to please everyone around her. I believe all of the pressure on her was a huge driving force in her inevitable marriage to Robert Wagner. On December 6th, the anniversary of their first real date, Robert took Natalie to Romanoff's and proposed to her with a diamond and pearl ring in her glass of champagne. The ring was engraved with the words, marry me. The next morning, the news was in all the papers and everybody was so happy. The public, you know, they were so happy. This was a great couple. This was a good pair. He was gonna be good for Natalie. And Natalie gushed to all of her friends about how romantic the proposal was. When her friend Marianne questioned her about the rumors that Robert Wagner was gay or bisexual, Natalie dismissed it and said, those are just rumors, that's not true. Natalie left her rebellious, wild, and independent teenage self behind the day she got engaged to RJ. She stopped driving her pink T-Bird, choosing instead a sleek black Cadillac. She began dressing more like the glamorous woman of old Hollywood, more sophisticated and adult. Natalie and RJ married in a small ceremony on December 28, 1957 with just family and close friends. She was 19 years old and he was 27. Their first go at marriage would last only five years. They chartered a boat from Miami for a month long cruise for their honeymoon. But once out on the water, a terrible storm hit and the boat was thrown around in the waves and wind as its occupants held on for dear life inside. Natalie was terrified. She was sure she was going to die. So they docked in New York City and stayed at the Waldorf before driving back to LA in a Corvette they purchased because Natalie was too afraid to fly. The last week of their honeymoon was spent on board Wagner's boat moored off of Catalina Island. Natalie recalls that last week as being the best, the two of them alone on the boat, surrounded by fog and silence. This time would forever hold great memories for both Natalie and RJ, and Catalina Island became a special place for them. Natalie became as emotionally and physically attached to her husband as she had become to her mother. If she had to be away from him to film a movie, she was sick the whole time. 
While he was filming in Love and War, she was on the set so much that they gave her her own canvas-backed director's chair that said associate producer on the back. And she turned down a really big role in a movie because she thought she couldn't be away from RJ for that long. Eventually, Warner Brothers placed her on an unpaid suspension because she was turning down every single film they put in front of her. When she turned 21, Frank Sinatra and RJ threw her a lavish surprise birthday party at Romanoff's. Sinatra and Dean Martin serenaded her, and now that she was finally of legal drinking age, she had set aside her days of overindulging and would only have a glass of champagne on special occasions. Natalie was out of work for a while, but then Splendor in the Grass happened, a film that the studio bought specifically for Natalie when director Aliyah Kazan said he couldn't get her out of his head since he had seen her in Rebel. The Wagners bought matching Jaguars and a new house in Beverly Hills, but as we know, money doesn't buy happiness. And Natalie began seeing a psychotherapist on Rodeo Drive as she continued to struggle with the identity crisis she had begun suffering with since she was six. In the medicine cabinet of her new glamorous home sat bottles of Secanols, Dexedrines, Nembutal, and Dexatrim. The Secanol and Nembutal were barbiturates. Nembutal was thought to be a contributing factor in the death of Marilyn Monroe. The other two were for weight loss. She was terrified of gaining weight. Natalie and Lana, who had always been close, became extra close at this time. Maria was trying to push Lana into acting again, and she didn't want to do it. Natalie moved Lana in with herself and Robert and cared for her like a mother figure, letting her sleep in the bed with them in an effort to protect her. Natalie knew all too well how complicated the life of a child actress was, how much pressure and stress it put on someone who was not ready to handle it. Natalie and Robert rented an apartment in New York City so that Natalie could begin filming A Splendor in the Grass, a film in which she starred across from the very handsome and new actor on the block, Warren Beatty. This was Warren Beatty's film debut, and although there are many rumors and speculations once again that fly around and say that Natalie and Warren Beatty had an affair while they were filming A Splendor in the Grass, kind of like a Mr. and Mrs. Smith thing with Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, Warren Beatty was engaged to somebody. Obviously, Natalie was married to RJ, and to be completely frank and honest, Warren Beatty annoyed the crap out of Natalie at first. He was young. This was his first picture. He was cocky. He was kind of like an annoying little brother figure to her. They definitely didn't get along to the point where everybody was worried that it would affect their love scenes together. However, Robert Wagner, who spent most of his time either alone in their apartment in New York City waiting for a call to come in about work that would never be offered or on set, watching his wife and Warren together, he became insanely jealous. Entertainment journalist Scott Hoover claims that Elia Kazan made it work, found a way to make Warren Beatty and Natalie Wood get along. The kissing scenes became more passionate and more realistic, and the next thing you knew, they'd be showing up on set and Warren would have his arm around Natalie's waist. It seemed like something had changed. According to Robert Wagner's own biography, he became so obsessed with thoughts that they were having an affair, he drove to Warren Beatty's house and sat outside with a gun intending to kill him. Obviously, he never did, but it does speak to how dark, possessive, and passionate about Natalie RJ could get. While she was dealing with her own personal conflicts brought on by RJ's sudden possessiveness and jealousy, she was dealing with her professional ones on set as well. In the movie, there was a scene where Natalie was in a bathtub and she had to have a verbal altercation with her mother about sex and purity. This kind of mother-daughter dynamic was a little close to home for Natalie. At the end of the scene, she was supposed to dunk her head underwater and then stand up completely naked and scream, I'm a good little girl, mom. Although Natalie in the past may have been considered free, she was not comfortable with showing nudity in a movie and she was definitely not comfortable with putting her head underwater. She not only managed to do the scene, but most likely drawing from all her old wounds and personal experiences, she nailed it. She moved everyone on the set. Afterwards, she was emotionally drained. Sometimes though, the director was manipulative in order to get the shots just right with Natalie. Towards the end of filming, they shot a waterfall scene at High Falls in upstate New York. Natalie's character tries to commit suicide by jumping off a ledge into the waterfall. She had been promised that she would not have to do the scene, that a stunt double would be hired, but when it came time, Natalie was told the stunt double couldn't really swim and she had to do it. 
When confronted with this, Kazan denied it and said he had never told her there would be a stunt double. But a woman did come forward and say that she had been hired as Natalie's double for the film and that she could in fact swim. It seemed like the whole story had been fabricated by Kazan in order to lure Natalie into a place of security, only to pull the rug out from under her and lie about the double not being able to swim well. A bright spot during the filming of Splendor in the Grass was when the Mirish company called Natalie and told her they wanted her for Maria in the movie production of the musical West Side Story. The producers wanted a big name actress that still had that young and innocent look and Natalie Wood would be perfect for it except she couldn't sing, she couldn't dance, she wasn't Hispanic. She was nervous about taking the role. She wasn't a professional singer. She wasn't a professional dancer. The role of Maria called for quite a bit of both, but she got a huge payday. She got offered $250,000 for doing West Side Story, which was, you know, I consider to be quite a bit of money in today's time. In 1961, that was a huge amount for an actress to be paid. The associate producer claimed that they knew from the start they were going to have to replace her vocals with a professional, but she claims she had no idea. So she threw herself into voice lessons. She wanted to do them proud. She wanted to show them that she could act, she could sing, she could dance. She threw herself into 12 hour rehearsal days, trying to keep up on stage with professional singers and professional dancers. And it just wasn't something she was able to do. She was uncomfortable with playing a Puerto Rican woman and having to do an accent. She wanted to make sure the accent wasn't some phony Carmen Miranda accent like she had to do in a previous movie. She wanted this to be real. In the end, Natalie was heartbroken when she learned that none of her original vocals would be used in the movie. She just wasn't a good enough singer. While Natalie's career was flourishing with Splendor in the Grass and West Side Story, her husband's was tanking. He just couldn't get a role to save his life. It bothered him and it probably caused him a good deal of resentment while he watched his wife win part after part. During the filming, Natalie developed throat problems, which she had put off for weeks until one day she had to be admitted to the hospital. She put them off for weeks because it was an echo of her mother's warnings about how she shouldn't be a problem on set. While she was filming West Side Story, she already felt inadequate. She already felt like she wasn't a good enough singer and she wasn't a good enough dancer and she couldn't keep up with the other actors and actresses she was there with. So she didn't want to seem like she had a throat problem and she was a prima donna and she had to be taken care of. She put it off for weeks and she was finally admitted to the hospital where she had to have a tonsillectomy. Now there was complications during the procedure and she almost bled out. While she was recovering, RJ started working on a new movie called Sail a Crooked Ship and the couple began planning a romantic trip to Italy that they would go on once RJ was finished with the movie. This romantic trip was not to be. For one night, Natalie woke up and found the bed next to her empty. When she went to go find her husband, allegedly, she caught him cheating on her in their own home, not with a woman, but another man. Natalie was a mess. She ran to her neighbor's house. She called her mother from there and then went to her family home and looked like an absolute mess. She was still wearing her pajamas. Her hand was bleeding because she had cut it when she squeezed a crystal glass so hard it broke in her hand. Of course, Robert Wagner denies this ever happened. He denies he was caught with another man. He denies everything. This is alleged. This is the story that has gone around. This is what people claim that she told them. So I'm just retelling it to you. I have no proof. Allegedly, supposedly, don't come for me. <laughs> After this shock, Natalie took too many sleeping pills and she fell into a coma. She claims later she wasn't trying to kill herself, she just needed the rest. Even though she still loved him, she knew in her heart she couldn't go on with RJ after what she had seen or what had happened between them, that it would never be the same. Divorce was the only option, but it broke her though. The heartache and the betrayal on top of so much heartbreak and betrayal that had already lived inside of her. The world was shocked and almost as heartbroken as Natalie herself. The golden couple, the love story, the perfect marriage. If these two couldn't make it, then who could? Natalie told any reporter who asked that what happened between her and RJ was too personal to discuss. By the end of July, Natalie had reconnected with Warren Beatty and the two did begin a relationship. She was devastated by the end of her marriage to RJ who had fled and went to live in Europe. Her self-esteem had taken a hit and she hated to be alone. She needed a replacement and Warren Beatty was there. 
Gossip spread like wildfire, blaming Natalie for the separation from RJ, saying that she had been having an affair with Warren Beatty since Splendor in the Grass, and that's why the marriage had broken up, because she fell in love with Warren, and she broke RJ's heart. She allowed people to think this. It was better than them knowing the truth. It was better to spare herself the embarrassment of having been blind to what was going on and to spare his career, because like I said, she did still care about him. She didn't want to break him. She didn't want to ruin him. She just couldn't be with him anymore. According to onlookers, Warren Beatty was mad for Natalie though. He may have been a warm body to her, but he adored her, but he was still immature. He still wasn't quite there yet. He was still kind of dazzled by Hollywood and everything that it offered. And he was cocky. He thought he knew better. Like everybody does when they're young in their twenties, you know, he thought that he knew better than anybody else. He was set in his ways and he wasn't really trying to meet anyone halfway or make any compromises in his life, even though he did really care for her. She clutched onto his arm and he smiled with pride as he escorted her to the Academy Awards, where she was expected to walk away with Best Actress for Splendor in the Grass. She was such a shoe in that Life Magazine had a photographer follow her around all day so they would be able to get the first picture of her, as her name was called but her name was not called. It was Sophia Loren who won Best Actress. Natalie kept her composure, but it was certainly a hard smile to hold, especially when West Side Story received 10 Academy Awards that night, none of which she was even nominated for. This same month, she officially filed for divorce from RJ, and she and Warren went on a two-month European vacation. But this romance with a man who was drawn to and fascinated by her, it wouldn't last either. Passion is a coin with two sides, and strong emotions run deep, whether they're good or bad. They were both very different, and neither one wanted to adapt to the ways of the other. Warren was late to everything, and half the time she wouldn't even know where he was or when he was going to be there. He was so laid back, almost laconic about everything. And she was a consummate professional. Showed up on time, always looked perfect, always acted perfect, did the right thing, said the right thing. And he was just like, whatever, I'm going to show up when I show up, and I'm going to say what I say, and I'm going to do what I do. She was married and divorced and still in that monogamous kind of mindset. And Beatty said he was confused about marriage, which pretty much meant that he didn't want to get married at that point, at least. Allegedly, allegedly what ended the relationship for good was when Warren Beatty cornered a 16 year old Lana, Natalie's younger sister, and tried to come on to her or seduce her. And, and Natalie claimed that was what she needed to finally walk away from him for good. But they did remain friends after. She later looked back on their time together very critically, saying, after my divorce, I was looking for rock Gibraltar. Instead, I discovered Mount Vesuvius, a live volcano with eruptions each day, and I contributed my share of fireworks too. Through a host of other men in movies, Natalie never let go of or forgot about RJ and what might have been. She and her sister Lana went to La Scala for dinner one night in May of 1964, and Robert Wagner was there too. He was happily announcing that he just had a baby girl with his wife, Marianne Marshall, who he had just married 10 months earlier. He passed out cigars to everyone in the restaurant, including Lana and Natalie, who did her very best to smile and congratulate him and be happy for him. But when she got in the car to drive home, she broke down and sobbed. RJ fathering a child with a woman that he had been married to for less than a year, when he and Natalie had been married for five years, started a baby fever in Natalie that would not ever leave her. But she had so many fears that she couldn't get over, that she was seeing a psychiatrist for every single day. And one of these fears was that she would fall in love with the wrong person, that she would give her heart to somebody who would hurt her again. She couldn't bring herself to trust someone again, to let someone in, let herself be vulnerable. She began drinking and smoking heavily again, and some believe abusing pills. At 26, she was a vibrant and smiling woman, and only the people closest to her could see the cracks in the happy mask she wore in public, but they were there. That's gonna be the end of part two. Thank you guys so much. I know it's gonna be a while to wait for part three because you have to wait for me to get back from CrimeCon, but I promise it will be worth the wait. Thanks so much for being here. I love you guys so much. I cannot wait to share my CrimeCon experiences with you. Keep an eye on my Instagram. You can follow me on Instagram and on Twitter. Those are both in the description box. Have a wonderful day. Stay kind and stay beautiful. Love you so much. Bye. She's like a sickness in my brain. A vision standing by the window pane. She ripples through the blinds and leaves me in a day.